Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Moss, and in this video, I'm going to introduce you to observability as code. First, I want to talk about the problem that we're trying to solve, and I'll briefly define infrastructure as code so that it's easier to understand the motivation behind why we need observability as code. The problem that we're trying to solve is managing infrastructure manually and the issues that arise from doing so. Imagine you're a cloud engineer at a small company and one of the members of the development team approach you. And they say something like, hey, we've got this uh, EC2 instance that is a build server, and that server needs to reach out to the internet uh, in order to download packages uh, that's required to build our software. But in order to do that, we need you to adjust a security group setting that's applied to that EC2 instance so that it can reach out to the internet. Oh, and by the way, this software release is scheduled to go out Friday, so we need it done yesterday. So under pressure, you as the cloud engineer uh, update the security group so that the build server can reach out to the internet and download the necessary dependencies. But what you didn't realize when you made the change to the security group is that that security group is also a security group for all production EC2 instances that are running the production software. So this results in a compromised security posture of your production systems and could potentially lead to a breach. So when we evaluate a scenario like this, what are the issues that arise when we're managing infrastructure manually through uh, the AWS console, for instance? Well, number one, it's prone to human error. It's possible that when you make the update to the security group in the AWS console that uh, you make the configuration too open and not restrictive enough. When you're making changes like this alone in the UI, unless someone is shadowing you, uh, it's very difficult to track the changes as well as control changes like this unless you have a very robust access control system uh, set up. Maybe after making that security group change, the security team identified that security groups uh, had changed on all the production servers. And how are they going to identify when that change was made and who made that change? It is possible to track that change back to a user and when the change was made, but you get essentially no context as to why that change was made or if it was a mistake. And then as the number of resources and the complexity of your system increases, it also becomes very difficult to manage uh, these systems at scale. The probability of introducing human error into a large scale system that isn't managed in an automated fashion increases as the number of resources and the system complexity increases. Not to mention, it's also very time consuming to manually create and manage resources. Making a simple change to a security group might be fairly trivial, but if you have to make changes across multiple resources, maybe 100 S3 buckets, for instance, it becomes a lot more tedious. So then what is infrastructure as code? Infrastructure as code means that you treat infrastructure the same way as you would code. So instead of managing infrastructure through a UI like the AWS console, you make changes to a text file that contains code, and then you can programmatically manage and create resources in the target platform. And there's a couple of very important characteristics about infrastructure as code. Number one being that infrastructure as code is declarative, and that means that you're defining what should be created rather than how to create it. And to solidify what that means, imagine if you wanted to create three EC2 instances in AWS and you did that using a Python script uh, that interfaces with the AWS API, you would create a for loop that iterates three times and each time it calls uh, an API endpoint that creates an EC2 instance. So if you were to define those EC2 instances declaratively, you would not be required to write out a for loop in order to define the EC2 instances. You can just say, I want three EC2 instances. And then the infrastructure as code program that you're using is going to abstract away the uh, need to implement a for loop yourself. The other key principle is that infrastructure as code is idempotent. If you were defining an EC2 instance in your IAC tools configuration file, and you applied that configuration multiple times to your target platform, it wouldn't result in the EC2 instance being created multiple times. It would recognize that that EC2 instance had already been created, and so it wouldn't attempt to create it again. 
So what are the benefits that we get when we implement infrastructure as code? Well, we can use standard tools like Git to version control IAC configuration files. And then when we make changes to those files, we can collaborate on those changes using things like GitHub pull requests. Those changes can be reviewed and approved prior to being implemented and applied to a target environment. Using infrastructure as code is more scalable than trying to make changes manually. You can automate the deployments of your IAC configurations in a consistent manner across multiple environments. And then if you deploy a change that breaks things, you can roll back that change much more easily if you're using an IAC tool. With these benefits, you're able to increase the speed at which you develop, scale your environment more easily, reduce the number of infrastructure-related incidents in your environment, and lower the time it takes to resolve incidents. Now that we've talked about infrastructure as code, let me introduce you to one of the most ubiquitous IAC tools in the industry, Terraform. Terraform allows you to implement infrastructure as code across a vast number of platforms like AWS, GCP, and Azure. And it uses the HashiCorp configuration language to define resources. Those resources are defined and tracked in .tf files. And Terraform abstracts the provider's APIs so that you can declaratively define resources in a target environment. In this very simple Terraform configuration example, we're defining the provider as AWS, which is the target platform where we will create our resources. And then below the provider block, we're creating a new AWS S3 bucket called example bucket. The bucket variable specifies the name of the bucket in AWS, and the access control list for this bucket is set to private. Now that we've talked about infrastructure as code and introduced you to Terraform, let's talk about observability as code. I've been using AWS a lot in my examples when talking about infrastructure as code, but Terraform isn't limited to provisioning and managing resources only on cloud providers. There's a large number of cloud-based applications who have created what are called Terraform providers that you can use to create resources inside of their platform. I consider observability as code a subset of infrastructure as code because when you're implementing observability as code, you're using an IAC tool to do that. But depending on how you look at it, you could probably see it as an extension of infrastructure as code as well. And Splunk has created a Terraform provider. With their provider, you can create and manage resources in Splunk Observability Cloud, like detectors, charts, and dashboards. And when you're using the Terraform provider to implement observability as code in Splunk Observability Cloud, you're getting the same benefits that you would get if you were implementing uh, infrastructure as code. You're able to control changes to observability configurations the same way you would for code changes. Your observability configurations can be in the same repository as your code base. Think about the scenario I brought up earlier about a cloud engineer making changes to a security group. And instead of a security group, you're making changes to a detector for your production systems. It's really important to make sure the configurations of your detectors are accurate and that changes to those detectors are controlled because you might end up in a situation where a change was made to a detector's configuration and now the detector is not alerting when it should be, resulting in a delayed reaction to production incidents. So when you use Terraform to manage resources in Splunk Observability Cloud, you're increasing your system's reliability. Not only that, you're able to scale your observability configurations more easily. And when a change is made that breaks things, you can easily roll back those changes. And something that I didn't mention before is that Terraform has modules, which is essentially reusable uh, Terraform configuration. And you can share these modules with your development teams so that when they are defining observability resources in Splunk Observability Cloud, you can ensure that they are all implementing them in the same way. And if you'd like to start using the Splunk Terraform provider, it's pretty easy to set up. You'd first want to specify the source registry of the Splunk Terraform provider. After doing so, you can then configure the actual provider with an organization access token and your Splunk Observability Cloud API URL. Once you've set up the provider, you can then define Splunk Observability Cloud resources. 
In this example, I'm defining a simple detector that detects high CPU utilization for a specific Kubernetes cluster. If you'd like to see me walk through this example, I have another video where we actually implement this detector in Splunk Observability Cloud. So be sure to check out that video if you're interested in learning more. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, we'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks for watching.